This episode is sponsored by Celestron, manufacturer of high-quality telescopes and an industry leader in developing exciting optical products with revolutionary technologies. I'm Kelly Beatty of Sky and Telescope magazine, and tonight we're going on a tour of the stars and planets that you'll see overhead during May. First, we'll highlight this month's lunar eclipse, watch four planets play tag before dawn, keep alert for bits of Halley's Comet, and get to know the Swiss Army knife of the night sky. So grab your curiosity and come along on this month's Sky Tour. We are so used to seeing the moon come and go each month that we sometimes forget how beautiful it really is. During the first week of May, the moon shows up in the evening sky as a lovely slender crescent that grows a bit fatter with each passing day. Here in the Americas, first quarter falls on the 8th and the full flower moon on the 15th. Then it disappears from the early evening sky with last quarter on the 22nd and new moon on the 30th. Around the time of full moon, it's easiest to make out clusters of dusky dark markings on the otherwise brilliant lunar disk. Before the invention of the telescope, sky watchers thought the moon was a crystalline orb that showed us a reflected version of Earth. Those dark smudges were thought to be mirrored versions of Earth's oceans and seas, and so they were given names like the Ocean of Storms and Sea of Tranquility. Today we realize the dark regions actually were seas of a sort, vast plains of molten lava that erupted and froze in place billions of years ago. And in a charming nod to history, we still know these features by their fanciful watery names. The full moon in May offers a special treat, as the sun, moon, and earth line up to create a total lunar eclipse. Unlike the lunar eclipse last November, during which the lunar disk didn't quite slide completely into Earth's dark shadow, or umbra, this one will be a no-doubter. And May's event also marks the first time that everyone in the contiguous United States will have a chance to see a totally eclipsed moon since January 2018, nearly three and a half years ago. This eclipse will be seen well throughout Europe and Africa in the hours before dawn on May 16th. But for observers across North and South America, most of the action will actually take place late on the evening of Sunday, May 15th, so mark your calendars accordingly. Within the U.S., the observing edge goes to those on the East Coast who will see the moon higher up in the sky than those out West. The partial phase begins at 10.28 p.m. Eastern Time, but watch for the first hint of dusky penumbral shading about 45 minutes before then. Totality is centered at 12.12 a.m. on the 16th. Again, these are all Eastern Daylight Time. Adjust accordingly for your time zone. On the 15th, Mid-eclipse is at 11.12 p.m. Central Time, 10.12 p.m. Mountain Time, and 9.12 p.m. Pacific Time. Those of you out west will see the moon already plunging into the umbra when it rises. The moon makes a fairly central passage through the heart of Earth's umbra, with totality lasting a generous 85 minutes. So expect a fairly dark eclipse, with perhaps a hint of brightening along the moon's southern limb. How dark is dark? Well, lunar eclipses can vary a lot, and many observers use a five-step estimate called the Danjon scale for judging how dark the moon looks while eclipsed. Or don't worry about that and just enjoy the spectacle. I hope you have clear weather that night so that you can enjoy the show. Pay attention to where the sun rises and sets, and you'll realize that those points are marching northward along the horizon as the days and weeks go by. That solar slide is due to the changing orientation of Earth's spin axis with respect to the sun as we northerners march through spring and into summer. The sun is also shifting northward for our Australian friends, but for them it means that autumn is gradually becoming winter down in the southern hemisphere. This shift also means that dawn's twilight comes earlier and earlier. And that's too bad, because the planets continue to put on quite a show in the pre-dawn sky you'll need to be outside 45 minutes or an hour before sunup. The two brightest planets, dazzling Venus and somewhat less dazzling Jupiter, start the month just a half a degree apart. They'll be stunning, 
so close together that you can cover them both with the tip of your pinky finger held at arm's length. But this close pairing is fleeting. Within a week, Jupiter moves quite a bit higher up, and the two planets will be several degrees apart. As Jupiter rises higher, it leaves Venus behind and starts to close in on much fainter Mars to its upper right. On May 29th, these two will be just a half a degree apart. Farther to the right, about four-fifths away, is Saturn. If you find yourself up well before dawn early in the month, you might poke your head outside to catch one or two shooting stars from the annual Eta Aquariid meteor shower. These are bits of debris shed by none other than Halley's Comet, so keep an eye out for them if you can. Conditions are great when this year's shower peaks on the morning of May 6th but you'll need to be outside and looking between about 3 and 5 a.m. Early in May, you have a great opportunity to spot Mercury in the early evening sky. Find a viewing spot with an unobstructed view down to the western horizon. Make note of where the sun sets, and then look above that point for a bright star twinkling in the deepening twilight roughly 45 minutes after sunset. There's a very thin crescent moon nearby on May 2nd. In any case, time is of the essence here. Starting about May 8th, this little world veritably dives from view, only to re-emerge in the morning sky before dawn in early June. Don't confuse it with the bright and slightly red-hued star Aldebaran, which is to Mercury's left by about one clenched fist. Aldebaran won't look particularly bright, but in reality it's more than 40 times the sun's diameter, and it outshines our star by 500 times. It doesn't look that dazzling because it's 65 light-years away. If you do spot Aldebaran, watch how rapidly it sinks toward the horizon night by night. Nearby is another bright reddish star, and it too is sinking fast. About two fists to the upper left of Aldebaran, you'll find Betelgeuse. It's commonly thought to mark the armpit of Orion, the hunter, most of which has sunk from view in the west but the original Arabic got mangled in translation, and the name probably refers to the hunter's hand. Other translations favor shoulder or arm. In any case, Betelgeuse is enormously huge, roughly 1,000 times bigger than the sun and 100,000 times brighter. It's about 220 light-years away. Directly above the sunset point, well up as twilight deepens, is a bright star called Capella, a name derived from the Latin word for goat. Swing your view to the upper left of Capella by about three fists until you come to a pair of stars that are roughly equal in brightness. These are the twins of Gemini, with Pollux on the left and Castor on the right. Look to the lower left of the twins for a bright star sitting on its own. That's Procyon, the brightest star in the small constellation Canis Minor, the little dog. And lower down, close to the southwestern horizon, as twilight ends, is Sirius, the brightest star in the nighttime sky, and the alpha star of Canis Major, the big dog. The evening skies of May feature one obvious star pattern that just about everyone knows, the Big Dipper. To find it, all you have to do is look up, way up. You should see the Big Dipper looming over you, with its curved handle bent upward, and its four-sided bowl apparently overturned as if dumping soup into some imaginary pot. Even though it's so well known, the Big Dipper isn't truly a constellation. It's what astronomers call an asterism, which is simply any group of stars that make an obvious pattern. The Dipper is part of a larger constellation called Ursa Major, the Big Bear. Right now, this woolly beast is on its back, with the stars in the Dipper's handles serving as the bear's tail, the bowl marking its torso, and its head off to the left. I think of the Big Dipper as the Swiss army knife of the sky because it helps me find so many other key springtime stars. For example, find the two stars at the left end, forming one side of the bowl. Sky watchers call these the pointer stars, and here's why. Draw an imaginary line through the pointers and follow that line downward by the width of three fists you'll come to a moderately bright star. That's Polaris, the North Star. You can use this little trick any time you want. Just remember that those two stars point to Polaris. Now follow the curve formed by the Dipper's handle, up, through overhead, until you reach a very bright star about three-fifths away. That's Arcturus, 
the spring sky's brightest star, in part because it's rather close to us, a mere 37 light-years away. Can you detect this star's pale ginger ale color by eye? Follow that same curved line past Arcturus into the southeastern sky until you come to a rather bright icy white star, which is named Spica, or Spica in proper Latin. Congratulations! You now know how to arc to Arcturus and Spike to Spica. Look a little to the lower right of Spica by about more than one fist for a lopsided trapezoid of four stars that are all about the same medium brightness. It's not far above the southern horizon at nightfall. This is Corvus, the crow, though ancient Babylonians knew it as the raven. In Greek mythology, Corvus is associated with Apollo and Coronus, one of his many lovers. In one version of this story, Coronus had been unfaithful, and Apollo learned about this from a pure white crow. In a fit of rage, he turned the crow's feathers black. Okay, let's return to the present. Go back to the pointers in the Big Dipper. Follow a line through them in the opposite direction, away from Polaris, and four or five fists later you'll reach Regulus, the brightest star in the constellation Leo. So now you can point to Polaris in one direction, or leap to Leo in the other. That's about it for this month. If you want more tips for viewing the night sky, including a free interactive star chart for any time or date, check out our website, skyandtelescope.org. If you haven't already subscribed, you can find this Sky Tour on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. And if you've enjoyed listening, please do leave a rating or review. It'll help spread the word about Sky Tour, and I really welcome your feedback. And if you want to explore the solar system and universe more deeply, check out the full line of binoculars and telescopes available at Celestron.com. Sky Tour is a production of Sky and Telescope, a division of the American Astronomical Society, and is produced by me, Kelly Beatty. Next month, we'll try to spot some of the lesser-known constellations in the late spring sky. Until then, I wish you clear skies. Clear skies.